epistle on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from Paul, St. Paul's first, excuse me, second letter to the Corinthians. Brethren, such is the assurance I have through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He also it is who has made us fit ministers of the new covenant not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministration of death, which is engraved in letters upon stones, was inaugurated in such glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it, shall not the ministration of the Spirit be still more glorious. For if there's glory in the ministration that condemned, much more does the ministration that justifies abound in glory. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer got up to test him, saying, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How dost thou read? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole strength, and with thy whole mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered rightly, Do this, and thou shalt live. But he, wishing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, And he fell in with robbers who, after both stripping him and beating him, went their way, leaving him half dead. But as it happened, a certain priest was going down the same way, and when he saw him, he passed by. And likewise, a Levite also, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came up, came upon him, And seeing him was moved with compassion, and went up to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And setting him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more thou spendest, I on my way back will repay thee. Which of these three, in thy opinion, proved himself neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? And he said, He who took pity on him. And Jesus said to him, Go, and do thou also in like manner. Those are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Now to the Christ day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, this Mass is offered for the intentions of Mary Lewis at the request of the Catholic Quiz Bowl. The scholar's question, who is my neighbor, is very typical of the debates that the rabbis were having during that time. Uh, The book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers both uh, had, even within each other themselves, both had things, ideas that seemed to conflict, and uh, certainly between the books, and who would be the objects of charity, the appropriate objects of charity. And the usual usual, um, way that the the Jews or the Israelites looked at it was only family, friends, 
maybe as broad as all Israelites, but nothing beyond. But um, on the other hand, Leviticus 19 commanded uh, people to give help to the foreigner among you. Then there was that case back um, uh, in Second Chronicles where Samaritans had uh, taken in a bunch of Judeans who, uh, they were enemies if you recall, but they had been hurt in battle and uh, rather than turning them over to their enemy, they uh, nursed them back to health and put them on their own mules and uh, took them back uh, to Judea. So most Jews, however, did, in their thinking, did not go beyond the Israelite nation, that is, excluding the Gentiles in practice. So Jesus has asked this question, and he tells the Good Samaritan parable. And the priest and the Levite don't stop because the law, the provisions of the law are all, they're all tangled up with the rules, ancient rules common to a lot of the peoples of the Middle East, ancient Middle East on the ritual purity. Uh, you do certain things, it may not be bad things, you do certain things and you're ritually impure. You come in contact with a dead person or somebody who's on their way, like this, uh, this uh, victim of the robbers, and uh, you become ritually impure. Now, so they, the, both the priest and the Levite, steered clear of it. It's interesting to note that they were heading down towards Jericho, so that it means almost certainly their time of service had been completed. And uh, so they weren't going to be unable to do their ministry because they'd already done it at least for the time being. But in any event, um, they ignored uh, the natural law com that comes from God, natural laws demand of what we might call human decency, in helping other people in their survival and, and their well-being. Jesus makes two points in this parable. Those who do charity are following God's law, not simply those who theorize about it, but those who do it. Hands-on type of charity is always best. Uh, you know, sending a check is good, but the, uh, the hands-on, the personal involvement or investment in the well-being of other people, assuming they want it, uh, is, is a good thing, it's a better way. Secondly, if you note, he reverses the perspective of the question. The, uh, the scribe had asked basically, what classes of people should I do good to? And he responds, you are neighbor, you have to be the neighbor. It's not whether this group or this group or these people are your neighbors, you have to be a neighbor, that is, your love and your helping has to be universal, has to be available universally. The scribes and Pharisees were um, formalists, to say the least, and they were looking for a list of who's worthy and who is not worthy of their attention. They say the rules of ritual purity we see time and again are used as selfish reasons by such people to excuse themselves from the requirements of the natural law. I don't want to get involved, in other words. Christians can be that way too. It's a human flaw, not a Jewish flaw. The, uh, and I can testify myself, if you're dealing with panhandlers in a place like Washington, New York, uh, things like that. It's like, well, if I were Elon Musk, I might have enough money to help them all out. But there's so many. Whom do I help? Whom do I help? And we get on a guilt trip about that. Uh, you know, well, I turned this down because he had alcohol in his breath, and you know, um, I didn't want to feed that habit and things like that. 
Uh, but then there are other reasons that people just don't want to be involved. They don't want to put themselves out. And Christians are certainly capable of doing that, too. Jesus traditionally has been seen as the Good Samaritan himself, both the parable and in fact. The robbers are, are said to be the world, the flesh, and the devil. Everything that takes our supernatural life away from us, it wears us down uh, so that we are not as devout as we should be or maybe even fall into the sin of a lack of charity. And uh, in the parable, the victim is all of humankind, stripped of all the supernatural virtues by sin. The incarnation, God the Son took human nature to himself. He reached out to the poor, to sinners, and he chose apostles from the humble of the world, not from the big shots. He dressed his wounds. The many wounds are from sin. Uh, it, not only particular sins, of course, but they come out of a darkened mind, a weakened will, subjection to pain, sickness, and death, and disordered passions. In other words, after the fall, humankind became a mess. And Jesus is here to clean it up. Christ binds up the wounds and gives us remedies, sanctifying grace that were won by his cross, he strengthens our wills uh, by hope, giving us hope, supernatural, the theological virtue of hope, and supernatural charity, which makes us love God's plan for us. Uh, again, my own testimony without particulars, I know many's the time if I've gotten older, I think about the really stupid and dumb stuff uh, bad stuff I did when I was younger. And uh, you just look at it and you think, well, I'm still rotten, but I'm not that rotten anymore. God's been working on me. Thanks be to God. And you, the evils of this life, according to Cardinal Herrera, uh, after the death of Christ, have an important part to play in the development of the spiritual life, unquote. That is, it's means to greater merit. It's a challenge to us that God allows uh, the evils in these lives, in our lives, so that we can uh, call on Him and use His uh, use His help and get thereby get closer to Him. Christ, the Good Samaritan, poured oil and wine into the wounds. The oil of divine mercy, which soothes, makes you feel good, and the, the wine of healing, which is uh, sharp, and bitter. It's like taking the shot, you know. I used to hate taking shots. You know, the flu shot was the worst. It's like a needle as big as my forefinger. I mean, it's just, uh, all, and they just, all right, now this is not gonna hurt, ah, ah, you know. But the medicine hurts for the time being, but it's needful. And so uh, the wine is a penance that we have to do, not only for ourselves, but for others, maybe especially for others. We could compare this with scripture itself. There are consoling truths that are put out there there's also what uh, is called terrible truths, that the existence of hell, God's wrath, all these things that uh, can, um, uh, will help sinners to wake up. Christ puts man on his beast. In the incarnation, through the incarnation, he raises man to God's level that you could go off and talk about the mystical body of Christ, which is very relevant here. Jesus daily takes on our works, involvement, personal attention. He lifts, if we ask him, he lifts with us with his merits and with the example of obedience 
and meekness, humility and meekness of all the virtues, in other words. Christ takes us to an end, which is the church, where we find everything for our healing and eventual glorification. The church teaches, governs, and sanctifies these wonderful sacraments. Jesus gives us here and here not only the command of universal charity towards others, but also the privilege of sharing in the redemption. Do you know that? We put ourselves out for other people, we make sacrifice, or just do penances and mortifications on our own. We are sharing in Jesus' act of redeeming the human race. We should adopt that intention when we do it. Everything we endure, everything we choose to endure, uh, and all the sacrifice we might make um, should be offered as a sacrifice to the living God. Uh, Christ's passion was entirely effective to repair the damage done through sin, but God has ordained that it should be perpetuated in the other members of his mystical body. That's a quote from Cardinal Herrera again. There's two big elements uh, in this. One is the increase of love of God and neighbor. The other I've mentioned before is reparation. It's not enough to repent. Sin takes with it a debt. And that debt has to be paid. If there is joy in committing the sin, there must be sorrow in repenting for it. We can compare uh, the uh, prayers and penance that we do for those in purgatory, uh, especially for those for whom no one else prays. I add that a lot. Pray for those in purgatory, and especially the ones that no one else is praying for. I can also testify an awful lot of younger relatives of faithful Catholics don't know they need to do that. And so we have to pick up the slack. Prayer and penances for those living and, and who don't know that they need to pay the debt of sin. All of this is meant to be our share in tending the wounds as Good Samaritan, as neighbors uh, of mankind. Christ will not ask us to do anything he hasn't already done it's, and is still doing. What do you mean still doing? He did the redemption once and for all. He's applying it. He's continuing to apply the graces, the oil and wine, you might say, the oil of mercy and the wine of healing, especially the sacrifice of the Mass and then the other sacraments, wherein he and we offers uh, in, once again, his self-immolation on the cross. We offer ourselves with him at the Mass. We should do that in just a few minutes, especially at the consecration. As the original creation is the activity of God alone that continues to the end of the world. You know, the, you find that in the catechism, I hope. Uh, creation was not a God did it and then that was that. I'm done now. I'm not going to dirty my hands with it. It's an ongoing thing. Otherwise, we'd, we'd disappear. So the creation uh, is there in the physical world. So is a new creation, the activity of God and us through taking our share in the redemption, continu continuing through, please God, all eternity. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.